Flowisdom presents The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Book Summary The Tipping Point Overview Gladwell begins by discussing the inexplicable resurgence of then terminally uncool hush puppy shoes among a handful of hipsters in Manhattan's cutting edge enclaves in the 1990s, a trend which soon spread across the United States and resulted in exponential increases in the company's sales. Using this phenomenon as an introduction to the book's analytical theme, the author states that he will identify, dissect, and explain the mechanisms by which certain trends take hold, while others fail. The Three Rules of Epidemics Chapter 1 Gladwell asserts that most trends, styles, and phenomena are born and spread according to routes of transmission and conveyance that are strikingly similar. In most of these scenarios, whether the event in question is the spread of syphilis in Baltimore's mean streets or the sudden spike in the popularity of hush puppy sales, there is a crucial juncture, which Gladwell terms the tipping point, that signals a key moment of crystallization that unifies isolated events into a significant trend. What factors decide whether a particular trend or pattern will take hold? Gladwell introduces three variables that determine whether and when the tipping point will be achieved. The three rules of epidemics that Gladwell identifies are the law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. He concludes the chapter with a preliminary discussion of the law of the few, noting that the origins of most major epidemics of sexually transmitted diseases can be traced back to the disproportionate influence of a few superinfectors who are personally responsible for dozens, or in some cases, hundreds of transmissions. This role is analogous to the category of people that Gladwell identifies as connectors, who play an inordinate role in helping new trends begin to tip or spread rapidly. The Law of the Few, Connectors, Mavens, and Salesmen Chapter 2 the attainment of the tipping point that transforms a phenomenon into an influential trend usually requires the intervention of several influential types of people. In the disease epidemic model Gladwell introduced in Chapter 1, he demonstrated that many outbreaks could be traced back to a small group of infectors. Likewise, on the path toward the tipping point, many trends are ushered into popularity by small groups of individuals that can be classified as connectors, mavens, and salesmen. Connectors are individuals who have ties in many different realms and act as conduits between them, helping to engender connections, relationships, and cross-fertilization that otherwise might not have ever occurred. Mavens are people who have a strong compulsion to help other consumers by helping them make informed decisions. Salesmen are people whose unusual charisma allows them to be extremely persuasive in inducing others' buying decisions and behaviors. Gladwell identifies many examples of past trends and events that hinged on the influence and involvement of connectors, mavens, and salesmen at key moments in their development. The Stickiness Factor, Sesame Street, Blue's Clues, and the Educational Virus. Chapter 3 Another crucial factor that plays a key role in determining whether a trend will attain exponential popularity is what Gladwell terms the Stickiness Factor. This refers to a unique quality that compels the phenomenon to stick in the minds of the public and influence their future behavior. An interesting element of stickiness, as defined by Gladwell, is the fact that it is often counterintuitive or contradictory to the prevailing conventional wisdom. To illustrate this point, Gladwell undertakes an in-depth discussion of the evolution of children's television between the 1960s and the 2000s. The PBS show Sesame Street represented a vast improvement in the stickiness of children's television, in large part because it turned many of the long-established assumptions about children's cognitive abilities and television-watching behaviors on their heads. These changes, based in large part on extensive research, resulted in a show that helped toddlers and preschoolers develop literacy. Years later, the television show Blue's Clues applied many of these same techniques to Sesame Street itself, resulting in the development of a program that research has shown can generate significant improvements in children's logic and reasoning abilities. The attribute of stickiness, Gladwell argues, often represents a dramatic divergence from the conventional wisdom of the era. The Power of Context, Part 1 Bernie Goetz and the Rise and Fall of New York Chapter 4 City Crime 
Another crucial aspect of the complex processes and mechanisms that cause trends to tip into mass popularity is what Gladwell terms the power of context. If the environment or historical moment in which a trend is introduced is not right, it is not as likely that the tipping point will be attained. To illustrate the power of context, Gladwell takes on the strangely rapid decline in violent crime rates that occurred in the 1990s in New York City. Although Gladwell acknowledges that a wide variety of complex factors and variables likely played a role in sparking the decline, he argues convincingly that it was a few small but influential changes in the environment of the city that allowed these factors to tip into a major reduction in crime. He cites the fact that many New York City agencies began to make decisions based on the broken windows theory which held that minor, unchecked signs of deterioration in a neighborhood or community could, over time, result in major declines in the quality of living. To reverse these trends, city authorities started focusing on seemingly small goals like painting over graffiti, cracking down on subway toll skippers, and dissuading public acts of degeneracy. Gladwell contends that these changes in the environment allowed the other factors, like the decline in crack cocaine use and the aging of the population, to gradually tip into a major decline in the crime rate in the city. The Power of Context, Part 2 The Magic Number 150 Chapter 5 For a trend to tip into massive popularity, large numbers of people need to embrace it. However, Gladwell points out that groups of certain sizes and certain types can often be uniquely conducive to achieving the tipping point. He traces the path of the novel, The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, from regional cult favorite to national bestseller. Gladwell notes that the unique content of the novel appealed strongly to reading groups of middle-aged women in Northern California, and that these women were uniquely well-positioned to catapult the book to national success as a result of an informal campaign of recommendations and advocacy. Gladwell also remarks upon the unusual properties tied to the size of social groups. Groups of less than 150 members usually display a level of intimacy, interdependency, and efficiency that begins to dissipate markedly as soon as the group's size increases over 150. This concept has been exploited by many corporations that use it as the foundation of their organizational structures and marketing campaigns. Case Study Rumors, Sneakers, and the Power of Translation Chapter 6 In this case, study-oriented chapter, Gladwell discusses the rise and decline of Airwalk shoes. The brand was originally geared towards the skateboarding subculture of Southern California, but sought to transcend this niche market and attained national name recognition. They succeeded in this endeavor with the help of an advertising agency with a unique understanding of the factors and variables that influence the public's perception of coolness. The marketing campaign ruthlessly honed in on and exploited several timely avatars of coolness, such as Tibetan Buddhism, Pachuco gang culture, and hipsters' ironic embrace of preppy culture rendering Airwalk shoes cool by association in the process. The company's unique strategy of offering unique products to boutique stores and a more mainstream shoe selection to department stores had long kept both cutting-edge hipsters and their more mainstream, impressionable counterparts' content. However, as a cost-cutting measure, Airwalk eventually began providing all of its distributors with a single line of shoes. Though the delicate balance that had long rendered the company's products cool in the minds of the public was disturbed, and sales declined significantly. Case Study Suicide, Smoking, and the Search for the Unsticky Cigarette Chapter 7 In another case study, Gladwell discusses the relationship between a sudden, alarming rise in suicide among adolescent males in Micronesia and the persistent problem of teen cigarette use in the United States. In both instances, teens were induced to become involved in potentially lethal experimentation. Gladwell asserts that both trends were predicated upon two main factors. First, teenagers are inherently, perhaps even genetically predisposed to imitate others and try on new behaviors and attitudes during adolescence. Second, the types of the people who are more likely to engage in dramatic, easily romanticized behavior, such as early cigarette smoking or suicide, 
are also more likely to be those that others tend to gravitate toward and seek to emulate. Gladwell also considers the origins and implications of the curiously large middle ground that exists between those who abstain altogether from potentially dangerous activities and those who engage in them in a consistently low-level manner. In terms of cigarette use, these chippers typically never smoke enough to tip into full-blown addiction and thus escape most of the ill effects of long-term tobacco use. Gladwell suggests that infrequent teenage experimentation with drugs or smoking should not be regarded with hysteria, but rather should be accepted as inevitable and is, in all likelihood, benign. Conclusion Focus, Test, Believe Chapter 8 In this chapter, Gladwell concludes with an account of the type of solution that reflects an understanding of the concept of the tipping point. A nurse seeking an effective, low-cost way to raise breast cancer awareness among African-American women shunned traditional routes and enlisted the help of hairstylists. In this environment, she reasoned, most people are relaxed and receptive to new information in a way that most education efforts can't duplicate. Gladwell acknowledges that this type of thinking is often derided as being a band-aid solution that treats symptoms rather than underlying problems. However, he asserts that these solutions are often the very type of cumulative, low-key approach that can, over time, build to a tipping point of massive popularity and influence. This was released from For the Sake of Education by Flow Wisdom. If the content was helpful, make sure to subscribe.